Good day, life science students. Welcome to video lecture episode 25. Today we're going to get into talking about animals, mammals, and just uh, animal behavior. Remember, we covered this stuff earlier in the semester, and I'm just really trying to review some high points on this. So let's get into animals, all right? Now, remember we talked about that animals have various characteristics and appearances which give them that diversity and beauty, but also distinguish them from one another. Remember I looked at some, we had some fun little pictures along the way. So let's talk about characteristics of animals. All animal cells are eukaryotes. What that means is every cell has a nucleus and a cell membrane. All animals are heterotrophic. That means they consume parts of other organisms. Hetero means other, troph means food slash nourish. Nourish, excuse me, and they have a digestive system. Now, animals can be broken up into herbivores, carnivores, or omnivores. Herbivores feed on plants, carnivores feed on flesh, and omniv omnivores feed on both herbaceous things, that's plants, and meat things. Okay, so think about some meanings right here. Herby, as in herbivores, refers to plant. Carny, carnivores, refers to meat. Omni refers to all, and then vore is the group. So when you see an herbivore, it's a plant eating group. Carnivore, a uh, meat eating group and omnivore an all eating group in other words there's you know they eat a little bit of both all right remember i had some funny pictures along the way in there now animals are classified as either invertebrates or vertebrates invertebrates are those without a spine some examples are like a snail a worm lobster octopus or a spider now even if they're invertebrates they may have an exoskeleton or uh, their skeleton on the outside and the other classification, vertebrates, are those having a spine. And some examples would include a fish, bird, lizard, snake, raccoon, elephant, us. Now they have what we call an endoskeleton, where invertebrates could have an external skeleton, that being an exoskeleton. We have an endoskeleton, which is a skeleton which is inside our body. Now classification within things that are vertebrates are fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. And just remember when we talk about vertebrae, we're referring to the bones in the back or the spine. Okay, remember I showed you some fun pictures of some invertebrates as well as some vertebrates as well. Uh, just showing you some differences there so you can see, and everybody probably remembers that picture I had a little kitty cat was in a towel we called a parito. Um, and then we also remember that maybe the shaved, the shaved guinea pig or equals a baby hippo. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember that, but I thought it was funny. Also know the distinction we talked about was ectotherm versus endotherm. Fish, amphibians, and reptiles are ectotherm. Ecto means outside and therm means temperature. In other words, their, their temperature is affected upon the environment. In fact, to clarify that more, the internal temperature of ectotherms vary based upon their surroundings. Now, ectotherms also are called cold-blooded. And like I said, I mentioned that's fish, amphibians, and reptiles. Now, fish, they're both salt and freshwater fish. They have gills, fins, and scales, and they live in water only. Amphibians like frogs and salamanders, they have a unique gill breathing larval stage followed by an adult terrestrial lung breathing stage. So they go between the two areas. And then reptiles, which includes like snakes and lizards, they have dry scales and lay soft shell uh, eggs on land. Now let's talk a little bit about endotherms because we've kind of touched on there already ectotherms and some examples within those. Endotherms regulate their own temperature. Healthy adult human temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Endotherms are also known as warm-blooded. So you have ectotherm, which are known as cold-blooded, and endotherm, which are known as warm-blooded. All right? Now, some things, let's just talk about fish for a little bit. Most fish have fins that occur in pairs. Fish breathe with gills. The gills filter the oxygen for fish. They reproduce sexually. They fish, they will circulate their blood via heart-pumping blood. And they have scales that are thin heart plates that cover and protect the body. All right? Now, is a whale a fish? Remember I asked that question, and whales aren't. They're actually marine mammals, something people don't realize. Well, let's now talk about egg birth versus live birth. If something lays eggs, in other words, that's how it gives birth to its new young, we call that oviparous, which is O-V-I-P-A-R-O-U-S, and that's egg-laying animals, little to no development of offspring in the mother. And then the ovi portion means egg, and then paris means bearing offspring. And then there's viviparis, which is V-I-V-I-P-A-R-O-U-S, and that's live birthing animals, young that developed inside the parent. Vivi means live, and paris means bearing offspring. And remember some examples of oviparis would be like a fish or a chicken, where viviparis would be like an orca or a cow or humans, also be included in that. Uh, then you remember that fun little picture I had on the slide here. It says, Old MacDonald had a farm. Keyword, had. And they had these cows with a fire in the background. It was kind of interesting. Now let's talk about birds versus mammals, just comparing them. Birds have feathers, lay eggs, and live in many different ecosystems. Mammals share some characteristics, such as having hair or fur, producing milk, and caring for their young. All right. 
Now birds are pretty amazing. Keep in mind something that distinguishes a bird um, is the fact of it having been able to fly, but also keep in mind they lay hard eggs. In other words, think about snakes. Remember they lay soft shell eggs? Well birds lay hard shell eggs. All right. Let's see if we can move on and get into some other discussions I think would be helpful. All right, so now let's move into mammals and animal behavior because I think we've covered a pretty good summary on just animal characteristics and distinguishment and classification. Okay, so let's get into uh, talking about mammals and behavior. Well, let's just remind ourselves briefly that remember mammals are endotherms, vertebrates, they have hair fur, they care for their young, and they produce milk to feed their young. All right. Now, let's talk about mammals in particular, their skin and glands. Skin covers and protects the bodies of all mammals. Skin produces hair and in some species, hooves, horns, claws, or nails. Skin contains various glands. Females have mammillary glands to make milk for their young. Oil glands produce oil and lubricate the hair and skin. Sweat glands in some species remove waste and help cool them down, like us as humans as well. And some mammals have scent glands to mark a territory, attract a mate, or, or a form of defense. Something kind of in interesting to think about. Now let's talk about teeth. Almost all mammals have specialized teeth. Front teeth are referred to as incisors and they bite and cut. Canine teeth grip and tear. Back teeth, which are, include premolars and molars, crush and grind. Omnivores, like bears and humans, have all four kinds. Carnivores, like a tiger, have very large canines, which if you look at pictures of a lion or a tiger, you can see what I mean by that. And herbivores, like horses, have large premolars and molars. Because think about it, they're constantly chewing and grinding up the food that they consume, that being plants. Now let's talk about hair as a characteristic of mammals. All adult mammals have hair on their bodies. It may be thick fur or only a few whiskers around their mouth. Fur traps air and helps keep the animal warm. Whales have almost no hair and rely on their blubber fat to keep them warm. Consider they're deep in the ocean. You can see why they would need to keep warm because it's very, very cold down there. Whiskers near the mouth may help sense their environment. Porcupine quills are what we call modified hairs, and they're often used for protection. And if you try testing that, you'll see the truth of that. Let's talk about some body systems. There's the circulatory system, which is where the heart pumps blood. The respiratory system, where lungs made of millions of sacs for oxygen and co uh, carbon dioxide exchange. Neurology, which is a combination of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves, is used for body functions and movement, and also mental emotional functions. The digestive system, which herbivores like a cow have a longer digestive tract because it takes longer to digest plants than it does meat, but we all as mammals have a digestive system. Reproductive, mammals give birth to live young. Some mammals can actually swim or walk as soon as they are born. It just depends on the development of that particular mammal within its lifetime. All right, now let's move into animal behavior, all right? Let's try to close it up with animal behavior. So let's first talk about this term connected was ethology, and that is the study of behavior in an organism's natural environment. Ethos is the Greek word for characters, all right? Character, excuse me. Now behavior, what is behavior? It's the way an organism interacts with another organism and its environment. Now let's talk about innate behaviors. Innate behaviors are inherited instinctive behaviors. For example, a bird builds a nest, a moth flies toward the light. These are things that they have just naturally as part of when they're born. Now let's talk a little bit about instinct, which is a part of innate behaviors. An instinct is a complex pattern of innate behaviors. For example, a spider building a web. Reflexes also gets put in there in this category of innate behaviors. And it's an automatic response that does not involve a conscious message from the brain. Okay, for example, our pupils, when we go into a dark or light room, you notice they adjust, and once again, that's a reflex, all right? Now, um, you could Google some things if you're really curious about seeing some more, but now let's move into learned behavior. Well, learned behavior is learning develops over a lifetime, so it isn't just instantaneous, it, it's a process, and it's the result of practice and experience, okay? The longer an animal lives and a more complex brain they have, the greater their learned behavior can be and can improve. So let's talk about some terms in connection with learned behavior. That's imprinting, trial and error, conditioning, and insight. Okay, Imprinting is a newborn animal's ability to recognize a parent or other object of habitual trust and form a social attachment. Okay, uh, You see this if you've ever raised any small animals. And you also notice this even with humans. We do this as well. Trial and error. Well, an example of this would be a chick pecked at a stone a few times and realized that wasn't food. In other words, the little small chicken realized, I keep pecking against this rock, but I'm not getting anywhere. It, this isn't food, and they learn not to go back to this, so trial and error. Let's talk about now conditioning. It's a behavior where it's a modified res in response to a stimulus. Think, for example, if you've ever owned fish or if you do own fish and you uh, start feeding, you know, putting the food, you open the lid and you put the food in, the fish begin to normally expect as soon as you open that lid that you're going to give them food, and that's conditioning. You're preparing them to have a particular response to a certain action. 
Well, the last one we're going to mention on learned behaviors is insight, and it's using past experience to solve new problems. Now, the example that I gave was where monkeys stack boxes to actually reach the bananas in their cage, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's, in other words, insight just says you have some information where you either tried something or saw something happen, and you learn from that, and you use that to solve any future or new problems that you do have. Now, let's talk about behavior interactions, and we'll see if we can close up in just a moment. Some animals form what we call societies. What is a society? Well, a society is a group of animals of the same species that live and work together. Some examples would be lions, gorillas, elephants, and wolves. Well, within these behavior interactions, there's also what we call territorial behavior. In other words, that's an area that an animal will defend from members for the same species. This is, in other words, uh, a group of particular wolves has an area they'll protect it from another group of wolves or from, an, uh, from an, uh, a different species as well. Now, the, what's the purpose? Well, to raise young, mating, or feeding. And how do they do that? Well, songbirds sing, sea lions bellow, squirrels chatter, some animals leave scent marks. Animals can defend a territory with their lives. And I've seen this in videos before. It, it's pretty... Um, pretty extreme and just a reminder just be careful don't go just playing with something thinking that oh they're just playing no these animals will really give their lives so to speak now let's talk about aggression in connection with territorial behavior it is a forceful behavior to try and control another animal even to try to take food away from a hungry um, excuse me what I meant was think about this have you ever tried to take food away from a hungry animal say for example like a dog or cat at the house don't do that bad idea now let's talk about submission in connection with territorial behavior as well. Uh, to avoid being injured, animals will show submission which stops aggression. In other words, if one animal is showing aggression, they'll submit to that animal, therefore to protect themselves. So these are just behavior interactions within the same species, but you can also sometimes see this within other, um, other species as well, like one species to another. Well, let's talk about communication, okay? And let's talk about some uh, terms in connection. We're going to talk about courtship, chemical, light and sound. Courtship. In order to gain the attention of a female, males are usually the more colorful ones and would dance, puff up their feathers, fan his tail, and other things. In other words, what you'll notice is within animal species, the male is brighter in color and that's done so they can attract a mate so they can obviously reproduce and have more of their species. Now let's talk about chemical communication. Ants sometimes moving in single file and dogs urinating on objects both use chemical means to communicate and they use what we call pheromones and what that is is they're powerful chemicals needed in only small amounts but it gets the job done. Now let's talk about light communication. Certain marine organisms use bioluminescence which is the biochemical emission of light by living organisms to either attract or warn. Okay, And you can probably think of some examples I'm sure might come to mind immediately with that but one thing I'll mention is that fireflies will light up at night to attract mates and so it's not just simply randomly flashing light, those light are being used to communicate a message to a fellow firefly. And let's talk about sound communication. Well, crickets chirp, beluga whales echolocate, rabbits will thump with their, with their, their, uh, with their paws, male and female mosquitoes will buzz at different frequencies to get each other's attention, beavers will slap their tails, frogs will croak, and gorillas pound. And these are just a few examples of sound communication within animals, all right? Now, just one more thing and then we will officially close the discussion today. Let's talk about two terms, hibernation and migration. Hibernation is a response to the cold weather. Their body temperature, that being the animal, becomes close to that of the environment and breathing becomes very slowed. They survive off their body, their body fat. Excuse me. Some examples would be bears, bats, reptiles. There are other ones, but those are what they do. They literally lower themselves to the minimal needs and live off body fat while they sleep until the temperature changes. Another one that's a response to climate is migration. Instead of hibernating, many animals move to warmer climates when the season changes. Some also migrate for food, mating, or the survival of their offspring. Monarch butterflies travel as far as 2,900 kilometers. They spend the winter in Mexico or California where it is warm. Mass migrations are one of the most fascinating behaviors, and remember I showed quite a few images of that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our lecture today. I know it was a bit longer than normal. I hope it's been helpful. Take care. Have a nice day. Goodbye.